It's not often that criminals strike fear into a community and then go on to reach iconic status. But the Craze and the Blind Beggar Pub are names that still resonate today. This film opens the casebook on twins whose reign of terror over much of London spanned more than a decade. And locked safely inside the crime museum of New Scotland Yard are their macabre mementos, including this weapon of intimidation, an ingenious but shocking device to incapacitate enemies, and the gun used to kill someone they regarded as a traitor, shot dead in a public house. The trial of the Cray twins and eight others at the Old Bailey was at the time, 1969, the most expensive, the longest trial in British criminal history. The twins had protected each other for years. Now, they shared in each other's downfall. 1952. London was just emerging from the austerity of World War II. Elizabeth II was crowned Queen after the death of her father, George VI. And Ronnie and Reggie Cray turned to a life of crime. The Cray's upbringing was just ordinary working class upbringing. I didn't think they were desperately bright for a start. And quite honestly, in those days, there wasn't that much of an opportunity for somebody with no great education uh, to progress. I mean, the mother was absolutely, or they were absolutely devoted to her, and she was to them. It was a perfectly good working class family. Along with all other young men, the two brothers were called up to do national service. But the army didn't suit them. After only a few hours, they decided to go AWOL, absent without leave. But not before resorting to violence and hitting a corporal on the jaw. For the next two years, the twins were either in jail, in guard rooms, or in military prisons. There they learned attentively from fellow detainees. They learned about the power of propaganda and the power of fear. Back on the streets, the Crays practiced what they'd learned. They flaunted violence. They made their mark. Quite honestly, the money that was available for villains and villainy uh, far outweighed whatever it was, a few, few pounds a week uh, in a respectable nine-to-five job. By 1956, the Crays had started to operate protection rackets, a way of taking easy money from local pubs, cafes, and illegal gambling joints, in return for protecting them from rival gangs. Though their income was good, they were still very much local villains, living and operating in part of London's East End. But their violence got them noticed. They were invited to team up with one of London's most notorious gang leaders, Jack Spot. Spot uh, had lost a great deal of uh, his army, as it were, and he needed physical backup. And he went to the Crays, who came from Stoke Newington, uh, which is a sort of a stone's throw from the East End, really. And he recruited them for strong arm purposes to provide muscle for him. Jack Spot became a mentor for Ronnie and Reggie and opened their eyes to new techniques, new ambitions new violence. They'd found their vocation. They'd learned how to make serious money. They'd take a step up the criminal ladder and were building a potent reputation. They would have a team of strong arm men themselves and they would go around and say, you don't want any trouble in your club tomorrow night, do you? Let, let us look after it for you. If there was trouble in the club and they moved in and within a fortnight all was peace and quiet and everything was profitable for everybody. If uh, somebody didn't pay up, well, they went round and explained why they should. The Cray brothers were making a healthy living, but they were always hungry for more money and more power. Their opportunity came when two large London gangs began to self-destruct. The Cray twins seized the moment and swiftly filled the vacuum. Their little empire suddenly became a big one. The twins by the 60s had a reputation. Not only had they 
interest in gaming clubs, little spielers down the East End and in Olgate, but they'd actually got interest in big clubs such as the very smart Colony Club in Barclay Square. But success did not come without trouble. The presence of another gang, the Richardsons, sparked huge rivalry and animosity. At this time, the Richardsons were south of the river. They were a firm south of the river, Charlie Eddie Richardson. They probably were what he would call crooked businessmen. To a large extent, they ran south of the river and the Crays ran North London, Central London. One of the gang members belonging to the Crays was George Cornell. Though originally from the East End, when he married a South Londoner, he defected to the Richardsons. That was bad enough, but Cornell overstepped the mark when he made a facetious comment that was never forgotten or forgiven. The Cranes were really upset with George Cornell, or particularly Ronnie was upset with George Cornell because he'd called him a fat poof in a London nightclub. In those days, homosexuality was not regarded as the thing to be attributed to a gang leader and Ronnie took great exception. So George Cornell's insult was to prove unwise. Ronnie had always been the more violent of the two brothers and the thing he knew best was revenge. Uh, Ronnie was extremely violent. Uh, if you crossed Ronnie you could expect a bad beating. He was psychopathic, without any doubt. Violent in the extreme, he shot a man called George Dixon for calling him a puff. In fact, Dixon survived. Uh, somebody said to him one night in a bar in Islington, uh, Ronnie, you've put on a bit of weight since I last met, and got the most terrible beating for it. Anything you said could be taken the wrong way. By 1960, everyone in London knew about the Cray twins. Their reputation for intimidation was spreading fast and made it hard for the police to draw any witnesses or evidence. One of the problems for the police with the Crays was that they did actually control the East End. Uh, they People couldn't really come and go without their knowing what was going on through a series of spies. If they went into a police, if someone went into a police station, the craze would know about it before the person came out. There was no question of anyone turning um, evidence against them. 1966, a gunfight broke out in a nightclub in South London between the Richardsons and some of the craze associates. The police moved in and locked up several of the Richardsons. The craze got bolder. March 1966, imagine we're at the Blind Beggar pub in Whitechapel, what was then a fairly poor part of East London, and a man called George Cornell walks in. He's from a rival gang south of the River Thames. He's walking straight into the craze territory. He sits down in the pub, he orders a drink, and what happens next sends shockwaves across the whole community. It would be in this pub, in full view of anyone who happened to be there, that Ronnie Cray took his revenge. This is the Crime Museum of New Scotland Yard. It's home to the world's largest collection of crime scene artifacts. In fact, only a select few have ever viewed these intriguing and sometimes rather grisly objects. But now with exclusive access, we can show you some of the secrets within. In 1960s London, the criminal underworld was ruled by gangs and violence. Twin brothers called Ronnie and Reggie Cray had intimidated their way to the top. Their reputation for violence made them almost untouchable. They ruled the streets by fear and had the weaponry to back it up. This crossbow was used to frighten anyone who might not do their bidding. This ingenious designer briefcase had a built-in syringe of poison, which would be jabbed into a witness's leg to prevent him from giving evidence. The Crays were never afraid to use force, and the psychopathic Ronnie was about to prove it in public view. 
Ronnie had been insulted by George Cornell. Cornell had defected to the rival Richardson gang and then had the audacity to walk into the Cray's local pub at a time when his own gang, the Richardsons, were in police custody. So we have to imagine we're in the Blind Beggar pub off the Mile End Road in Whitechapel in East London. George Cornell, way out of his own South London territory, has walked in for a drink. Heaven alone knows why. Right in the middle of the crazed territory. Well, he'd been to see a friend in hospital who'd been shot a few days earlier and just stopped off for a drink early in the evening. No doubt he thought, I'll have a drink and be on my way before anyone really knows I'm here. The barmaid had just come on. I don't think the manager was there yet. And... Uh, the wire goes out to Romney Cray to say that here's the hated George Cornell. Ronnie had never forgotten that George Cornell had insulted him. And now Cornell was displaying a lack of respect for the Cray twins' territory. It was time for Ronnie to get his revenge. With another couple of the, of the team, he goes there, orders a drink, and just shoots Cornell blind in the head. Then what? Then walks he out? puts his glass down, walks out. Uh, somebody was sensible enough from the Cray point of view to pick up the glasses and take them away and off they go into the night. So no fingerprints left no behind? No fingerprints on. left behind. Tell us about this. Well, this, we think, is the weapon that was used in that murder. It's believed to be the Luger used by Ronnie Cray to shoot and kill George Cornell. For a long time afterwards, the joke was you went into the blind beggar and said, can I have a Luger and lime? For Ronnie, killing Cornell was a moment of triumph. As far as he was concerned, he'd committed the ultimate crime without fear and in full public view. His reputation was at its zenith. None of the witnesses to Cornell's killing would help police with their inquiries. And with no evidence beyond the corpse, the police were powerless to press charges. Ronnie, always an egotist, swaggered all the more and taunted Reggie that until he too had killed, they could not be regarded as equals. I've done mine, you must do yours. It wouldn't take long for Reggie to take up the challenge. Leslie Payne, their brilliant financier, was no longer flavour of the month. Uh, they thought he was turning on them. What happened was they arranged for Jack the Hat McVitie should kill Leslie Payne. The craze gave Jack the Hat a gun and a large cash advance to kill Leslie Payne, but he failed to complete the contract. What's more, he kept the cash. That was all that Ronnie needed to encourage Reggie, and the pair of them invited Jack the Hat to a party. The Hat had been in the pub around midnight. He's fetched by some of the Cray henchmen, comes down into this basement flat in Stoke Newington, yells, where's the birds, where's the booze? And instead there's Reggie with a gun. Reggie shoots at him, the gun misfires, uh, and the hat tries to escape out of a window. Reggie says, be a man, and McVitie says, I don't want to die like one. He's then held by Ronnie, and Reggie stabs him in the face and the body. Apparently there's blood all over the place, and they got a couple of women from across the road to come and clean it up. And the body's taken away. Possibly, one never knows with these stories, but the stories that he was buried at sea, uh, fed to pigs, um, put in a, um, a local swimming bath furnace, or cremated in a double coffin. But he was never found? Never found. For at least the second time, the Cray twins had killed in cold blood, and with no witnesses coming forward, the police were powerless. What were their motives? Did they like the violence? Were they greedy? Were they out for notoriety? What was it? I think they wanted respect. Uh, that's the big word in the criminal underworld, uh, respect. And they got it without doubt through a matter of fear, beatings, uh, surrounded by these henchmen who would 
do their bidding. Uh, people got shot, people got stabbed, people got slapped. They were, they ran, ran by fear. The thing that people feared was a summons uh, from Ronnie and Reggie, and you had to obey it. If they said they wanted to see you, you went, apparently. And it was fine if they invited you to Valence Road where their mother was. You knew you were safe, nothing would happen there. The trouble was when you were invited to the Regency which was a club in Stoke Newton. If you went to the Regency, then you had to be absolutely on your best behaviour and stand to attention and salute. The Crays felt invulnerable and their future looked secure. Virtually no news about the murder of Jack the Hat had leaked. And yet behind the scenes, the police were busy building a case against them. The efforts to get them are hampered, one, because the East End's vow of silence, two, because they've got certain police officers, if not on their side, at least looking after their backs. They don't make them like that anymore, do they? I mean, we just well, don't seem to have these sort of high-profile villains who are able to take over entire areas and dominate them in the way that the Crays did in the East End and the Richardsons in the South of London. No criminal who's any sense, and this was one of the failings in the Crays, that they adopted a high profile. What you really want, it, if you're a criminal, is never to be heard of. But everyone knew who the Cray twins were, and many convinced themselves they were charming, charitable nightclub owners, and part of London's swinging 60s scene. They were snappy dressers, of course. They were very pleased to be seen at... Um, in nightclubs, restaurants, they're mixing uh, with politicians who of course they could use for their own benefits. They mixed with, you would call I suppose, generally speaking, B-list celebrities. I think that people like being flattered. They like being taken out to nightclubs, given one, a given drink, girls at their elbow. But not everyone was charmed. The twins' old adversary, Inspector Leonard Nipper-Reed of New Scotland Yard, had been promoted. His assignment now was to bring the Cray twins down. To prevent leaks, Nipper Reed worked in secret and began the painstaking task of building evidence against the brothers. But he needed a break, and it came from a most unlikely source. Nipper Reed got hold of Leslie Payne, and the whole of the murder investigation starts really. The Crays were, to a certain extent, losing their their popularity in the East End. One or two of the members of the firm quickly changed horses and decided that uh, it was a question of I'll save myself while I can. These whistleblowers gave Nipper Reed a series of compelling statements on condition they wouldn't be used until the Cray twins were detained. A Scotland Yard conference decided Reed had collected enough evidence to do that, and early on the 9th of May 1968, the Crays and several members of their firm were arrested for murder. With the Crays off the street, Nipper Reed had a matter of hours to convince more witnesses to come forward without fear of reprisal, and it paid dividends. Tell us how eventually the police did manage to prove the case against the Crays. What happened was once, uh, once he got some people talking, then others came along. He managed to get hold of the barmaid and explain to her that she would be safe. Well, they were convicted eventually of the Cornell and McVitie murders. Uh, the Cornell murder was largely on the evidence of the barmaid. Uh, other members of the gang gave evidence about the McVitie murder, which took place in a basement in Stoke Newington during a, quote, party, unquote. They got people who would give evidence who'd been at the party. And uh, they got hold of the woman whose flat it was, uh, who was, in fact, the woman who was known as Blonde Carol, and she was seriously instrumental in giving evidence. Once people began to talk, it proved relatively easy to get a conviction. The twins' only defense was to deny everything. On the 8th of March, 1969, the Crays were imprisoned for 30 years for the murder of George Cornell. Some of London's East Enders admired the Crays, even though their cruelty could be almost pathological. In fact, such was their control. No one dared speak out against them until they were safely behind bars. 
Yet there's a paradox at the end of all this. When Ronnie Cray dies in prison, there's a funeral in the East End. The very society that he's intimidated, blackmailed, terrorized, murdered, comes out and throws flowers at the funeral cortege, or at least quite a number of people do. Everything that they did and touched suddenly turned to gold. Whilst they were in prison, uh, there were people who were printing t-shirts. You could get interviews with them for a, a fee. They had become media darlings. A large part of the East End of London really was terrified of the Cray Twins. They had enormous power because they were so psychopathically violent. Yes, because they were absolutely violent and they were, uh, they were twins for a start. Um, and that meant you had to take them both out as opposed to one because the other one would come after you. For 130 years, the Crime Museum of New Scotland Yard has been archiving the tools, the relics and the instruments of the most notorious killers, the most infamous conmen, the most audacious of thieves. Nowadays it's a training ground for police and judiciary, but it's also a sombre reminder of humanity's capacity for evil and a tribute to the triumphs of Scotland Yard. videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you.